Chapter 4, Chemical Bonding and Molecular Geometry. We'll begin with section 4.1, Ionic Bonding. So we touched on ionic bonding a little bit at the end of chapter 3. So ionic compounds are formed by ions. Ions are formed by the transfer of electrons from one element to the other. So with that example we looked at at the end of chapter 3, sodium chloride. Neutral, a neutral sodium atom has 11 electrons and 11 protons. And so as we learned in the last chapter, sodium likes to lose one electron and become the plus one sodium ion. Now if we look at chlorine, neutral chlorine has 17 electrons and 17 protons. Chlorine likes to gain one electron to become the chloride anion. So these two are a perfect match. Sodium will transfer one of its electrons to chlorine, which forms the sodium ion and the chloride ion. So now we've got sodium ions, we've got chloride ions, and these two ions bind together because of the electrostatic attraction, because the opposite charges attract one another. This is what forms the sodium chloride crystals that we see in table salts. So positive and negative ions are held together by electrostatic attraction, which forms a three-dimensional crystal lattice structure. Now the formula here, NaCl, simply refers to the ratio of sodium ions and chlorine ions. It's not quite the same as with the molecular or covalent compounds, where the formula may actually tell us something about the bonding itself. It just refers to the ratio of the ions here. So NaCl means one sodium ion for every one chloride ion. Just to recap, the electronic structure of ions, recall from chapter three, when you make an anion, you add electrons using filling rules. And when you make a cation, you take away electrons from the highest end first. And just be careful with transition metals here if you're making a cation. Okay, so that is actually it for section 4.1. We're gonna go ahead and combine uh, section 4.1 and section 4.2 together since 4.1 is so short. So moving into section 4.2, covalent bonding. So covalent bonds, they are formed by the sharing of electrons. So for example, H2 is the chemical formula of the hydrogen gas molecule. Now H2 is formed when one electron from each hydrogen is shared in between these hydrogen atoms. So each hydrogen atom brings one atom to the table and they share those two electrons in what's called a covalent bond. Now covalent bonds are formed because of the net result of the attractive and repulsive electrostatic forces. So we've got attractive forces, we've got repulsive, for, uh, repulsive forces. So we have nucleus electron attractions. So the nucleus electron attractions, so this nucleus is attracted to the electrons from this atom. This nucleus is attracted to the electrons from this atom. So those attractive forces are greater than the repulsive forces because these nuclei, which are both, both have protons in them, those positive charges are repulsing each other. And then the negative charges from the electrons of, bo of both atoms, this is also a repuls uh, repulsion force but the nucleus electron attraction force, uh, they are greater than the repulsion forces. This results in a net attractive force that holds the atoms together to form a molecule. So this is what forms covalent bonds. All right, now we're gonna take a brief detour here and we're going to talk about electronegativity before we get into uh, the polarity of covalent bonds. So electronegativity, is defined as the ability of an atom in a compound to draw electrons to itself. So it's, oops, sorry. It is a little bit different than electron affinity. Electron affinity is the energy released or absorbed when an atom gains an electron. So an electron affinity is the energy released or absorbed when an atom gains an electron. Whereas electronegativity is simply the ability of an atom to draw electrons to itself. So there's a slight difference here, and this is illustrated most clearly with noble gases. Noble gases, they all have very low electron affinities because they do not like gaining electrons. However, krypton and xenon, they can form compounds because they have a lot of D electrons, so they actually have a relatively high electronegativity. So when something like krypton or xenon gains an electron, it would require probably a lot of energy to be absorbed. It's a very unfavorable process 
So noble gases, they have very low electron affinities. However, they have the ability to draw electrons to themselves, which is why they have relatively high electronegativities. So that can be seen here with krypton and xenon, which have relatively high electronegativity values. Now, electronegativity, it follows the same trend as ionization energy and as electron affinity. It increases going left to right across the periodic table, and it increases going bottom to top up the periodic table. So elements towards the top right have the highest electronegativity values. Okay, now once we've discussed electronegativity, we can get into the two different types of covalent bonds. So there are nonpolar or pure covalent bonds, and there are polar covalent bonds. These nonpolar covalent bonds are formed when two atoms of the same nonmetal or nonmetals that have very similar electronegativity values share a bond. So because these atoms have either similar or the exact same electron electronegativity values, the electrons are shared evenly between the two atoms. So for example, chlorine gas, it's two, two atoms of chlorine joined together to form this chlorine molecule, um, chlorine molecule here. So because these two chlorine atoms have the exact same electronegativity, they share these electrons in the covalent bond evenly. Now with polar covalent bonds, they are made by two different nonmetals with a significant difference in electronegativity values. Because they have different electronegativity values, they want electrons more or less than each other, and electrons are shared unevenly. For example, hydrogen chloride, HCl. Chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen is. It wants the electrons more, so it will pull these electrons in the bond closer to itself, so the electrons are shared unevenly. So we can think of this like a tug of war. If we have two of the exact same atom, or two atoms that have very similar electronegativity values, they pull on the electrons in the bond evenly. So it's like a game of tug of war, where both sides are pulling with the same strength. And so the electrons stay in the middle. They are shared evenly between these two atoms. Whereas if we get something like chlorine, which wants electrons much more than hydrogen does, we can think of like it, it's much stronger than hydrogen is, so it pulls those electrons towards itself, and so the electrons are not shared evenly anymore, they are shared unevenly. Chlorine is pulling those electrons towards itself. All right, let's try a knowledge check question. Classify the OH bond in CH3OH as ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar covalent. All right, correct answer here is B, polar covalent. It is not ionic since oxygen and hydrogen are both nonmetals, so this must mean it's either polar covalent or nonpolar covalent. And if we look at oxygen and hydrogen, they have pretty significantly different electronegativity values. Oxygen wants electrons much more than hydrogen does, so these electrons in this bond are not going to be shared evenly. This is a polar covalent bond. All right, now let's talk about how we represent polar bonds. Now they can be represented in two different ways. You can use arrows like this, or you can use these delta symbols right here. So these delta symbols represent partial positive and partial negative charges. Now if you're going to use an arrow, the arrow should be pointing towards where the electrons spend most of their time. So with hydrogen chloride, I would draw this arrow facing chlorine since that is where the electrons will spend most of their time over on the chlorine atom there. Or if I was gonna use partial positive and partial negative charges, I would put a partial positive charge over hydrogen since it's lacking electron density a little bit. And I would put a partial negative charge over chlorine since chlorine has a bit more electron density around it. Okay, now to determine who gets those charges or where the arrow faces, again, just remember electronegativity values. Compare the electronegativity values of the two elements in that bond. The element with the higher electronegativity value gets the partial negative charge because that element wants electron, electrons more. The element with the lower electronegativity value gets the partial positive charge or the arrow faces away from it because that element wants electrons less. So hydrogen, 
has a value of 2.1, chlorine has a value of 3.0, so thus hydrogen gets the plus, chlorine gets the minus. All right, now we can use these electronegativity difference values to compare two elements in a bond and to compare polarities. So we can compare two or more bonds. Whichever bond has the greater electronegativity difference will have a greater polarity. For example, let's look at the, the four halogens, so hydrogen to iodine, hydrogen to bromine, hydrogen to chlorine, and hydrogen to fluorine. So we've got the commonality here, they all have hydrogens, but we've got different halogens here. We've got iodine, bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. So you'll notice here that we're getting more polar. We're getting more polar because the halogen is getting more electronegative. Fluorine is the most electronegative of these four, then chlorine, then bromine, then iodine. So here we have a relatively small electronegativity difference, whereas the electronegativity difference gets bigger as we go left to right here or as we move up the periodic table. So the hydrogen fluorine bond is the most polar because it has the biggest electro electronegativity difference. All right, let's look at an electro electronegativity and polarity example. Arrange the following bonds in order of increasing polarity and tell which atom of each bond is partially positive and which is partially negative. So the electron electronegativity values for each atom is given here, or they are given here. So hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1, carbon 2.5, sulfur 2.5, nitrogen 3.0, and oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. All right, so what we wanna do is we wanna tell which of these bonds is most polar. So we wanna compare those differences. So we look at carbon versus hydrogen, carbon versus nitrogen, nitrogen versus hydrogen, oxygen versus hydrogen, and sulfur versus hydrogen. So I've arranged these in a table here. So start starting with carbon to hydrogen. Carbon, its electronegativity is 2.5. Hydrogen, 2.1. So the difference is 0 0.4. So a difference of 0 0.4. Here, hydrogen would get the positive charge. Carbon would get the negative. Next up is sulfur to hydrogen. Also a difference of 0 0.4, since sulfur 2.5, hydrogen 2.1. Again, hydrogen gets the plus, sulfur gets the minus. When we look next at carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen electronegativity of 3.0, carbon 2.5, so a difference of 0 0.5. Here, carbon gets the positive and nitrogen gets the negative. Notice that carbon is getting the positive here because it has the smaller electronegativity value whereas up here it had the larger electronegativity value, so it got the negative. Next is nitrogen to hydrogen, a difference of 0 0.9. Here hydrogen gets the plus, nitrogen gets the minus, followed up by carbon to oxygen, a difference of 1.0, and finally oxygen to hydrogen, 1.4. So here the most polar bond out of these six is the oxygen to hydrogen bond, because those two atoms, those two elements, have the biggest difference in electronegativity, 1.4. All right, now let's just think about how we use the periodic table here. Now we have three types of bonds. We've got, again, those nonpolar covalent bonds, which have two of the same nonmetal or nonmetals with very similar electronegativity values. We've got polar covalent bonds, two different nonmetals with sufficiently different electronegativity values, and finally, ionic bonds which are metal and non-metal. So we group these bonds into these three categories. However, really it is more of a continuum between nonpolar covalent and ionic because there are many different values for electronegativity differences. We are just kind of arbitrarily putting, drawing these lines in ourselves, but it's really just more of a continuum here. Okay, so the general rule we're going to use is that for a bond to be considered nonpolar covalent, we are going to say that its electronegativity difference has to be less than 0 0.5. To be considered a polar covalent bond, we're going to say it's between 0 0.5 and 1.8, and anything greater than 1.8, we're going to call that ionic. So for example, oxygen to oxygen, a difference of 0, so it's a nonpolar covalent bond. Nitrogen to oxygen has a difference of 0 0.5, so we would call this a polar covalent bond. Magnesium versus oxygen has a difference of 2.3, Thus, we would refer to this as an ionic bond.
Now to summarize, in general, I do expect you to know what electronegativity is, what the trend in electronegativity is, and how we can apply that to determine if covalent bonds are going to be polar or nonpolar. However, I am not going to expect you to memorize the actual numeric electronegativity values, and if I ask you a question like that, a table with the relevant values will be provided. So you may be asked to explain the general trend and to look at differences between atoms, but you will not be asked to memorize the actual numeric values. Okay, so here are a few practice problems for you to try. So if you'd like to try these, pause the videos and give them, uh, give them a try, these five problems. And then here on the next page are the answers to those problems. And you can download the slides if you'd like to check this out for yourself. So that concludes section 4.2. I'll see you in the next video for section 4.3, Chemical Nomenclature.